This is Anna Adamek in Ottawa. Could you give me your name? Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Glenn Nolan. And um, could you tell me maybe something about yourself, about your, let's start with your childhood. Where were you born? Uh, sure, I was born in northeastern Ontario in a small community called Chaplow. And uh, I was uh, raised in a, uh, a very traditional uh, Cree family that uh, uh, kind of lived off the land, um, had very little access to you know, modern amenities, uh, running water, um, uh, power. Uh, we had outdoor privies and, and we heated with wood. Uh, what were your hobbies when you were a child? Oh, I did just hanging out in the bush, uh, playing with my cousins, uh, uh, playing everything from uh, uh, exploring, yeah, you know, the bush and uh, trying to chase rabbits and uh, just getting into mischief. And uh, could you talk maybe a bit about your primary and secondary education? Uh, <clears throat> well, we, we moved around a bit because my dad was in, in mining and eventually took a job as a miner in a local mine. And I uh, went to uh, primary school there, uh, moved to other uh, towns and cities in Ontario, uh, kind of following my, my father as he worked at different uh, mining operations, and ended up in uh, Atacokan, which is in northwestern Ontario, uh, doing um, high school. And then I went off to uh, Sioux College in the mid-70s to get a... Um, diploma in geological technician uh, and then um, went back to school in the 90s to get my teaching degree. Uh, so you said your father was in mining. Uh, could you give me the name of your father? Uh, yeah, my dad, is. Uh, his, his name uh, was Ken Nolan and uh, he comes from the, our community as the Missinabi Cree and uh, we were just um, uh, next to a uh, a gold mine that started in the late uh, 1940s and uh, would hire from the local uh, workforce uh, men from our community and eventually my dad took a job there. And what did your mother do? Um, my mom was a, a homemaker uh, but she also had her own business uh, at, especially at the mine site. She uh, did the laundry service for the single men so we had a number of single men that lived at the mine and she would do their bedding uh, which was a contract with the mining company, but she also did the the men's private clothing, and uh, and she did all that. It was kind of amazing uh, because she did it year round. There were no dryers at the time, so she hung everything up outside in the winter until it froze, and then she would bring it in and hang hang clothes up in the kitchen near the wood stove. Um, so she was busy, and she did all that with a ringer wa a ringer washer, and when she became um, I guess made more money, she could do more washing, so she had a second ring of washer. Uh, and that, she, that kept her pretty busy, plus raising nine kids. What was her name? Uh, her name is Helen. Uh, so did your parents encourage you to go to mining or geology? Um, they, they encouraged me to stay in mining uh, because all my older brothers uh, worked in a mine or uh, started off in the mine as, as a young, young man. Mm -hmm and uh, end up getting some sort of trade and moving on. Some of them moved on, some of them stayed in mining for the rest of their professional careers. Um, and my mom, when I said I want to go away to school, she said, well, you can get a job as a tradesperson, you know, a welder or a mechanic at, uh, at the local mine in Atacokan when I was in high school. And I thought, no, it doesn't get me out into the bush, uh, which is where I really wanted to be. And, and by happenstance I ended up in the geology program at Sioux College and and found out that uh, this is going to keep me in the bush I can work outside all the time and so that's why I stayed with it. At Sioux College did you have any uh, notable teachers someone you really someone who you considered your mentor at the time? Uh, not so much I mean there was a we had some good you know, uh, professors there uh, Manfred Engel who was a uh, mine engineer from Germany was our one of our uh, professors and he he's memorable because he was very flamboyant 
and uh, loved his stories about working in the coal mines in Germany and working in other mines around uh, Europe. Uh, but I, I would say the person that uh, really sparked my interest in mining uh, from, from the exploration side was a geologist by the name of Ray Bernatches. Uh, he worked at the Steep Rock Iron Mine as in, the, uh, in the lab there. And on weekends, he would go and prospect. And uh, he took me under his wing one summer when I was a summer student at one of the mines in Atacokan. And I uh, would go with him on weekends and do some exploration, uh, just prospecting, going around collecting samples, uh, drilling a few old crops, uh, and just walking around the bush. And I said to Ray, is this, you can get paid for this? And he says, absolutely. And I thought, wow. You can get paid to do this. This is something I want to do. So you mentioned Ray. Uh, are there any other people you consider your mentors? Um, well, once once I got into the industry, um, there's uh, um, an individual that I worked for when I worked at Cominco Limited, which is no longer a company. It's actually now Tech uh, Natural Resources, I believe it's mm -hmm. called. Um, anyway, Tech. And uh, Tech and Cominco uh, merged uh, back in the 80s. And uh, before then, uh, I worked for Al Scott. Uh, he is a geophysicist at, uh, at Cominco. And he really inspired me on my work. He, uh, he trusted me. Uh, he, I guess he valued what I was able to, to offer to the company and offer to his program. And he kept me inspired to... Um, to, to even try to do more and uh, I love doing the work that he uh, offered uh, for me as an employee uh, but he also gave me a lot of freedom to do things my way and uh, I was able to I think uh, contribute something to the company uh, through through my initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you wanted to be outside, you wanted to work in the forest with nature, uh, so was that one of the main reasons why you chose industry over academia? Oh, uh, you know what, uh, growing up, uh, I don't even think that was a thought to, to be in academia. Um, you go to work, and academia was not something where I considered it work. Um, you go and study, and then you get a job. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't think that, you know, it's, it's unlike, um, I think when you're, when you're in, from a family that is basically uh, blue-collar workers, the thought is, do you want to be a blue-collar worker and work with your hands, uh, be, be a, a mechanic or a welder or something in that line, or do you want to do something a little different? And to do a little something a little different is not, you know, going into academia. It was okay. I, I can still work with my hands, but I can be outside. What what is it that I can do? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, prospecting and doing geophysics and doing geology was uh, was the kind of um, direction that I took. Uh, what was your first job? My first full-time job was with a company called uh, AMOC. It was a French, uh, national French company uh, that was um, uh, exploring for uranium. And actually they had a mine in northern uh, Saskatchewan called uh, the Carswell Lake Mine or no, Clough Lake Mine. And uh, I worked at their exploration camp, which was, which was at Carswell Lake, just north of Clough Lake. And that was my first full-time job. So after I finished school at Sioux College, I took a job with, uh, with uh, AMOC, and uh, it sort of helped me to, um, well, I'd done some of the work before, some of the geophysics before previous summers. Uh, this was my first time where I had my own crew, and, um, you know, again, it, it really kind of cemented the fact that I love being out in the bush. And uh, this offered me a lot of freedom on traveling around, being in different places, uh, uh, you know, using unique methods of travel, motorboats to get to different sites, uh, helicopters, uh, fixed wing planes. Uh, and, and it really was something that uh, kept me inspired that this was something I really enjoyed to do. Uh, could you outline quickly your career for me? Well, I started 
Uh, I started off in 79 with a full-time job. Um, but previous to that, I did work at the uh, an iron mine, an open pit iron mine in Atacokan called Kalen, Kalen Ore, and uh, another American company that was operating in Canada. And uh, it was one of the two mines in Atacokan, and most young people worked there. Uh, you know, that were in high school, they they got jobs, especially if you're your parents, one of your parents worked there, you would get a summer job. And it kind of exposed me to a number of areas within a, a mining operation, an open pit operation, uh, that I think was, was kind of unique today. Uh, my first season there, uh, I was basically um, janitorial support and I did some painting and um, my boss at the time uh, worked in the pit. I had to clean washrooms, and she said I was the best toilet bowl cleaner, <laughs> and I took pride in that. Yes. Um, and it was something I guess my parents always said: if you're going to do a job, do it well. And so uh, Shirley was always complimentary on how clean my washrooms were. Um, the next year, uh, they elevated me to um, running uh, supplies to different parts of the mine from from the warehouse, and uh, when I wasn't busy doing that. They had me doing other things like driving truck, uh, those big uh, haul trucks. Uh, I got trained on that. I got trained as a uh, blaster's helper, so I got to mix chemicals and, and dynamite and blow things up. That was fun. Um, that was only for two weeks. Uh, so I got these short-term um, um, placements where people would go away for holidays. And, but it still was not, I wasn't out in a bush. And I kept thinking, you know, that's, it's fun, but I don't want to make a career out of it. And so that's when I decided, because I know some of my colleagues uh, that I went to school with uh, that took jobs in mines and became part of the mining operation. Uh, I took a different path and I decided that this was something that I wanted to pursue, which is uh, the exploration side. And, uh, and that led me to... Um, you know, traveling all over northern Canada, uh, experiencing some truly remote and beautiful areas uh, that I got to uh, be part of a, an exploration program. Uh, sometimes uh, just a couple of us out uh, working uh, for a couple of weeks at a time in a very remote area. Uh, got to just experience, uh, you know, what Canada has to offer in the way of uh, scenery and and uh, diversity in its landscape and uh, so I did that for a couple of years uh, I worked for Cominco and then I started my own company and uh, became a contractor uh, just at the time when a lot of companies seemed to be getting rid of their their uh, exploration companies our exploration departments and moving into uh, hiring more contractors to do the work what was the name of the company? Uh, Talisman Consulting. And we, um, we, it was myself, and then I would hire my team to go and work. Started off just doing uh, geophysics. Uh, and that evolved into building camps for, for ex larger exploration projects, and, and then eventually managing those camps. So I you know, did everything from staking claims to doing run cutting the lines to do the geophysics and to do the mapping, uh, to putting the camps up, establishing the camps, and then managing the camps, even with uh, you know companies having their uh, their crews stay in there, and um, but it, it also demanded a tremendous amount of my time, mm -hmm. uh, so that in around 1989, 1990, I sold uh, that business. Uh, because my my son, who was quite young at the time, uh, didn't like me being away from home. So. Uh, and where did you live at the time? I lived in Atacokan. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started off living in Vancouver for a number of years and started the business there. And, and then I went, I moved back to Ontario to work at the Hemlo development. And uh, at Hemlo, there, it was just starting to get started and there was a lot of uh, contract work there. So I would uh, I moved to Atacokan because I went to high school there. And, uh, 
and uh, it was a convenient location and moved my family there and I would commute to Marathon every week and work for the week and come home on weekends. Uh, that got to be too much as well. And um, so um, it, it was all part of the, the process and that's the, the industry uh, uh, at that time was uh, not very family friendly. Uh, you were gone for months at a time and uh, it just became very tough for, for my wife and for my young family uh, to have me gone for that long. So you sold your company and then what? Well, What's the next step? Uh, well, I, I continued to um, advise, you know, work um, in winters doing small uh, geophysical jobs and especially in, uh, mostly in the, in the far north. I kind of specialized in um, some winter, you know, cold weather geophysics, which is always a challenge, mm -hmm. um, trying to keep your instruments operating in, you know, under extreme cold conditions. Uh, so I developed a few ideas that I would I was able to uh, keep my my instruments operating, and I worked up in some uh, fairly remote uh, northern locations. Could you describe one of those innovations for me? Uh, I was just battery packs that I could put inside my coat as opposed to in the instrument that you couldn't put in your coat, mm -hmm. and then and so it wasn't anything uh, extremely innovative, but it just uh, allowed me to keep my batteries warm basically and uh, sometimes they would have uh, batteries that were um, you know specialty batteries but I would just rig up uh, you know uh, D cell batteries to, to uh, with the same voltage uh, that would do the same kind of job uh, power the instrument uh, but it would allow me to uh, work all day in uh, minus 30 weather mm -hmm. whereas you wouldn't be able to do that with uh, most of the instruments that just the battery life wouldn't be long enough. Uh, so, um, so I, so I, uh, one of the things I end up doing was I moved into tourism uh, during the summer months because it allowed me to be with my family and it allowed me to take my kids on some of the, the wilderness uh, tours that I did with uh, mostly Europeans. So I would bring in. I had a cultural, cultural tourism program and uh, would uh, educate uh, Europeans about m my culture, my Cree culture, and um, what my family, uh, who my family was, and, and uh, some of the stories I, I could relate to them from our, from our culture. And, uh, and then I got back into this mining sector in a big way, advising my community of Missinabic Cree uh, of the potential for mining. Uh, there was a few companies that were knocking on the door of my community asking for their participation in the sector and uh, I at, around that same time I decided that I wanted to enter politics and I ran for chief of my community and um, once I became chief I was also very active in negotiating with companies on agreements uh, looking for uh, opportunities to supply those companies, uh, those uh, mining projects uh, with, uh, with various uh, services. What, what was your um, goal or what was your approach to these negotiations? Um, well, first of all, it was to explain who we were to the company and that we're, we wanted to talk, that we weren't there to oppose uh, projects that um, included us, that were that was sustainable, that were, had environment as a priority uh, to protect, and that uh, the jobs, uh, some of the jobs and some of the business opportunities came to my community. And companies at the beginning were a little reluctant because I, I think we we brought a different approach to to uh, the table when it came to having these discussions. And um, <clears throat> some of the uh, some of the companies were, I think, a little surprised uh, because we we had a different approach when it came to uh, negotiating with the companies, and it uh, I think it opened up the eyes of some of the uh, 
mining executives that we dealt with. And it, led, it then led me as, uh, as the chief to uh, start uh, working with the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada uh, to try to uh, bring out more uh, stories about companies working well with communities, communities working well with companies, uh, maybe discuss areas of conflict and how to resolve those conflicts. What, when is this happening? This is in the, the early 2000s. And uh, a, a person now who is, is a good friend of mine asked me to join the board of, uh, of PDC and so I ran for um, the, uh, a position on the board and I got in and uh, a few, I think, um, years after that we um, well, we're very active on bringing a, an Aboriginal program to the convention. The convention, the PDAC convention, is the largest um, mining-related convention in the world. Uh, so we've had upwards of 30,000 delegates come through over the three days that we uh, are uh, holding the convention in Toronto. It's been 85 years in, uh, as an operation. It um, brings together the uh, companies from across the globe uh, to to meet. I think we had 125 countries represented. Uh, so every, everyone comes from from across Canada and around the globe to meet uh, during that week because it is a place that uh, is a great place to network, look for financing, uh, to sell your properties or to find partners for your properties. It's also a great place for suppliers to try to uh, uh, market their uh, what they can offer to projects. So I, I thought it was a good opportunity for me to offer uh, a world view that is different from the mining perspective. Uh, as, a, as a First Nation person and a leader, I thought that we had a a, a unique story to tell and share and I believe by working with the with the industry we could build a a common purpose of, to work together and uh, that led to I think a very successful Aboriginal program that was uh, started in 2004 and it's grown every year and it's still uh, one of the top attractions for the convention even though it's a mining convention, we have a lot of Aboriginal content now. Uh, we uh, signed the first agreement uh, with the Assembly of First Nations of any outside organization to work with them to share information, as it was uh, with the Assembly of First Nations. And uh, that was signed in 2008 uh, at the convention. Uh, took a lot of negotiations with the with the team for the, the grand or the national chief uh, Phil Fontaine at the time, and and then I was, uh, was my role on the board. Um, somebody suggested that that I I run for uh, an executive position on the board, and I got elected as second vice president, which is you then move up to first vice president after two years, and then so on until you become president. And so in 2011, 2012, or 2012, 2013, I was president of the PDAC. And uh, I'm very, always honored to have been given that um, um, recognition by my peers uh, you know, in the industry. Uh, they entrusted in me that I could lead an organization that has 10,000 members across the globe uh, that speaks for the industry, but also uh, brings together uh, perspectives from Indigenous people and and the mining sector together in a in a common voice that uh, leads to uh, uh, a collective growth. Absolutely. So you own your own company. You are a chief of your community. You are a president of PDAC. You are a VP of another company. What are you the most proud of in terms of your career? Um, you know, I think it's giving back. Uh, 
my my father and my mother were uh, committed to working in the community, uh, volunteering their time, uh, doing a number of things to make our community better. And I remember that as a young kid. And my father was one of the first Aboriginal people to be on a school board. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we still have the letter from the Lieutenant Governor thanking him for his service as a, uh, as a board member at the, on the school board. Uh, he didn't do that because he wanted to be the first. Uh, I think he did it because he felt he had a duty to uh, give back. So I saw that and I tried to leave my life uh, where I contribute through volunteerism. That's, I think, my career has allowed me to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's provided me with a foundation of, of wellness, foundation of support and uh, um, care that uh, now I can, I can give back. And even today, uh, my wife and I still do a lot of volunteering. And so that's, to me, those other things, yeah, they're good, but being able to give back is even better. Um, could you talk about the most memorable project that you were involved with? Uh, oh, there's so many of them. Mm. <laughs> there, you know, whether it's spectacular scenery that I was working in, or the number of kilometers I walked in a single day uh, to conduct surveys because I had to get done. Uh, <clears throat> flying for hours and hours to get to a project site by helicopter uh, and uh, you know having to stay overnight on the land because uh, helicopters broke down and couldn't pick us up or having a windstorm up in the high Arctic and not being able to travel and being stuck away from camp for the night uh, those are you know has nothing to do with mining it's all part of the mining experience but um, it was something that you know, I still look back and go, wow, that actually happened to me. Um, you know, the, my career has taken me to Latin America. Uh, and I've, I've done some, you know, when I was a kid, I used to, my, my dad was a guide. And some of the, his clients would send us uh, National Geographic. They, that they had read and they'd send it up to us and, and I remember going through the, the magazine when I was a young kid and seeing images of jungles and Africa and, and I, I always thought oh, I'd love to do that in fact all my time I'd spend in the bush I, I'd make believe I was either in a desert or a mountain or a jungle and, and uh, so I actually had to live I got to live that life you know I've got to climb mountains I've got to uh, uh, run wild rivers. Uh, I've worked in the Amazon. I've worked in other jungles. I've uh, partnered with uh, indigenous people in, in Ecuador and Peru. Uh, I have uh, wonderful relations in Guyana and uh, Venezuela, and Guatemala, Honduras. Uh, you know, I, I keep pinching myself that I got to do all this because of the career choice that I made. Uh, and I, I, you know, that to me is very, I'm, I've been a very fortunate person uh, to have experienced these experiences and, and got to do things that uh, I only dreamed of as a, as a young, young man, yeah, a kid. Now, the most difficult project or the most challenging project that you were involved with? Um, right now, there's, uh, uh, as the vice president of uh, government relations with uh, Noron Resources. We're developing a mine in North Northern Ontario. It's uh, the first time a mine has been developed in that region. We're about 500 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. No roads into the area. It's a, a large wetland, the third largest wetland in the world. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, physical challenges, you know, distance from roads and so on, uh, wetlands and uh, just the isolation. Um, those are challenges. Those are all technical challenges and can be accomplished and can be dealt with. Uh, the most challenging part is that uh, some of the community members still don't uh, trust us. Uh, 
even with our best methods and best uh, efforts, we still haven't completely uh, built the trust that is needed for some of our community partners. And that is the, has been the most challenging. It's been very frustrating as an uh, Indigenous leader, uh, former chief. I, I appreciate their concerns, uh, but I also know the benefits that come from being involved in a mining project and that it's not for five years, it's not for ten years, it's generational. Mm -hmm. The benefits that will come out of their participation will have a, they'll have a different community in you know, three generations from now. The way my, my community has seen that kind of growth, uh, personal growth, as well as monetary growth. I mean, I don't want to uh, say that that's the only reason you're in mining, is to have, have wealth, uh, financial wealth, but it's a reality. Uh, you know, the industry pays very well, and uh, if you're working in the industry, whether you're a shovel operator, whether you run heavy equipment, you're a mechanic, a geologist, uh, an accountant or an executive, you get paid well. And this has been transformative for my community, working in the mineral industry, but it's also, I believe, an opportunity for communities to derive that same benefit in the north but we can't get through that trust factor. Mm -hmm. That's been the single largest challenge, or uh, the, the challenge that we're faced with right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't talked yet about your current position. So can you tell me when you joined the company, how, how your career developed within this specific company? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back. Um, I, I knew the uh, gentleman who's passed on now, unfortunately, uh, his name is Paul Semple, and I, I built a relationship with him when, when I first started, um, uh, when I was first elected as chief, and I would go to the, the mining conferences and um, representing my community, and I met Paul, and Paul was uh, an engineer, mining engineer, and uh, had worked across the globe, and uh, we struck up a friendship and uh, a lot of common uh, interests um, outside of mining. Uh, but he carried himself about his concern for bringing Indigenous people into the mining sector. And uh, so I think he was beyond thinking much earlier than most people about how important this was in projects. And so we maintained our contact over the years from early 2000s. And then in 2009, uh, I was contacted by Paul uh, to, to sit on an advisory committee for NORAT. Uh, NORAT had just gone through a change of board members and executives, and, and uh, he, he thought that I would make a good fit uh, to advise them on Indigenous relations, Aboriginal relations. And, um, within a couple of months he offered me a full-time job and so I started with Noron in 2009 um, as the Vice President for Aboriginal Affairs and my role was to build relations with the communities uh, so we ended up hiring some local uh, community members as liaisons and we were in the communities often we were spending uh, quite a bit of time uh, talking with uh, community members not just the leadership and uh, we're, we, uh, we're making some progress on building those, those relations. And then um, we made outreach to some of our uh, community members that we were working with to offer them positions within Noront. And, and then we, uh, <coughs> we have one in particular that uh, we've promoted. Um, who has now taken over my position uh, as, on a, as a manager of Aboriginal relations or community relations. And uh, 
for me, that made me feel uh, like we're, we're doing what we need to do, which is bring people in, uh, give them the mentoring they need, and then um, uh, allowing them to uh, foster their own ability within the organization and grow within, within Neurant. And, and then once they've, uh, they have that uh, capability, new capabilities, um, put them in the positions that they can uh, uh, thrive in. And we're, we're doing that, whether it's at the camp or whether it's in uh, uh, our, our office in Thunder Bay or in, or in Toronto. And, and at one point, um, two years ago, my, my uh, president and CEO, Alan Coots, thought that uh, I would be a good fit if I was uh, looking after the government relations because I've, you know, ironically, when I was chief, that this is what I was doing, you know, meeting with government officials on a regular basis. and. And yes, it does seem to be a good fit. And uh, then now that we have uh, an individual kind of doing my job, uh, previous job, uh, so uh, I'm really fortunate that uh, I moved in with you know almost nine years with the company. I've uh, uh, kind of had uh, expanded op uh, opportunities and uh, new new um, uh, requirements for fulfilling my my role with Norad. Uh, in your opinion, what are the major changes uh, that you could see throughout your career in relations between mining industry and uh, indigenous communities? Well, I think it's more the um, the fact that we we've identified areas that that companies need to fulfill. Um, in, in establishing relations with communities. You know, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, mining companies were already hiring indigenous people. They just didn't make it a big issue that, oh, we've got to hire, you know, you know so many 10% or 20% of, of indigenous from the local population. Uh, they never said, uh, "Oh, we've got to, you know, have a procurement policy for business, uh, First Nation business or Indigenous business." They never did that, but they were, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, my my father, I have uncles, uh, great uncles, my grandfather, uh, my brothers, my cousins, um, you know, dozens of them worked for the mine. It wasn't a big operation, but dozens of, dozens of them, and. The majority of them went on to expand their careers that started with either electrical or mechanical or uh, and taking the taking them off to their those opportunities or those new skills to other places uh, some of my brothers stayed in the mining industry some of my cousins stayed in the mining industry and continue to be even today their children are working in the industry um, but today um, there's regulations that say you've got to consult. Uh, mostly the government has to consult, but some of that obligation is, is for the companies to make sure that the information about the project is accurate and uh, the best way to do that is to, to do the um, uh, work themselves on informing the, the, uh, uh, the communities about what it is they're doing. And you know, recently there was a call to actions for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I believe, you know, before that report came out, I believe that uh, we've been doing it as an industry. We've been reaching out to the communities, helping them on a number of fronts. Um, you know, I look at my own my own father. He had a grade three education when he entered the mine in whatever year that was. And he ended up, the, the mind said, you've got to get, you're, you're very good, Ken, at what you're doing, but you need to get a ticket. So you're a good welder, so now you got to go to school, but you need your grade 10. So my dad would sit at the kitchen table getting his, doing his lessons with my, my older sisters, my older brothers. It was, um, it's kind of interesting when you think back on it, but 
the company wanted him to get his education. That's part of, I'm not sure what number it is in the 94 calls to action, but education is important. Um, Health care. Um, you know, the mine offered, it was a company town, but the mine offered nursing service. We never had that. We're, you know, our, our community never had nursing. Uh, Health care, not in the same way. Um, better housing. Even though the housing t from today's standards would be substandard, it was better housing than what we had. We had running water. We had flush toilets. We had, uh, that was the first time I ever saw a tub. It was, you know, uh, coming to, to the mine, mine uh, the mine community. Um, uh, power. Turn on a switch and you've got power. Uh, so I think the companies have been doing that a long time, it's just never been structured. Today though, um, companies are really, really want to ensure that if they're going to put efforts into this relationship building, that the communities are part of that decision making of where the effort is best spent and where the money is best spent so that more is accomplished. Uh, so I think that's the difference, you know, 40 years ago there wasn't any talk about uh, reconciliation or in consultation or engagement, it just, things just happened. Today we're, we're obligated to consult, to engage communities, uh, and by simply having those relations built, we're doing that, we're accomplishing uh, those goals and we're we're able to say yeah, yeah we're, we're addressing health issues we're addressing educational issues we're addressing social development issues um, at our at our mind sites and helping the communities just by having a healthy workforce that goes home to a community every two weeks um, we're going to be creating a more healthy uh, healthier communities as well what is your advice to someone who is starting in this career or to a student who is considering this career? Well, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of speaking to a number of um, universities and to students that are either close to graduating or uh, in the middle of their, uh, um, their programs, you know, two years in or three years into their, their degree. And I say, you know, from, from my perspective, there's a lot of uh, positive uh, opportunities that come from the mining sector. There are some challenges, you know, you tend to have to leave home uh, to, um, I mean, if, if you have a family. Uh, but if that's something, if it's something that excites you about being in new places and discovering uh, new areas or, I mean, not, not necessarily discovering something, but just being there for the first time. Uh, and if you like being outside and uh, if you like, you know, traveling to different countries and meeting new people, then this is a, a really neat career. It has, uh, there's so many positive things that uh, kind of evolve out of that and uh, your career can take you in a number of different directions, starting off as a geoscientist or as a mine engineer. Um, that, that can lead you to um, you know, doing some pretty amazing things. And you know, we talked earlier about some of the, um, you know, the financial leaders and what they've done with their accumulated uh, wealth is they've given back to universities and given back to um, charities, other charities. So it's not just about them, it's about what eventually what they can do uh, to make the world a better place. Is there anything else you would like to add? Um, that, you know, I, I, don't, I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't make that decision when I was 17 or 18 years old that I want to look at uh, exploration, mining exploration as a, as a career. It still was you know, kind of nebulous. It wasn't something that I totally understood until I got into it. Um, but I was able to, I 
I had a passion for being outside, and I realized that my next exploration was a vehicle to keep me as keep me outside as often as possible. And uh, I didn't realize the extent of how much I would travel. I didn't realize the extent of where I would be 20 years later or 40 years later uh, after starting my career uh, back in the 70s. And uh, where that's taken me you know, ge uh, geographically uh, across the globe. And um, I always shake my head thinking I came from such a, such a remote, uh, disadvantaged community and to where I am today uh, you know having the these opportunities presented to me is uh, I, I I couldn't be happier thank you very much for this interview you're welcome mm -hmm.